Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, Blessed and Beautiful Homestead. I am really excited to share this evening with you guys. It's just kind of a low key day here on the homestead. It is at the time of this recording, it's the day before Christmas Eve. So I wanna really get this uh, done and uploaded for you guys. I'm just gonna be wrapping Parker's Christmas presents and doing a Q&A with you guys. I posted a Q&A over on Instagram and on the community wall here on my channel asking you guys for questions that you would like answered. Basically, nothing was off the table within reason, of course. I'm pretty transparent with you guys, and I've gathered those questions. I don't know if I'll be able to answer all of them, but I'm gonna do my best. All right, you guys, I got my present wrapping station going on up in her. I'm hiding in the room to wrap presents, obviously, so Parker can't see what we got him. Some of these things you guys saw when we went shopping uh, and got some of this stuff from Bass Pro. As I always say, no judgment on my present wrapping, okay? And I came prepared with lots of tape, and I've got more in the kitchen if I need reserves. Let's start with our first question. And this one is a doozy. <laughs> so Kimmy's Cuisine, uh, it's cut off. I can't read the rest of her name here. But she says, how do you deal with a toxic family member? Okay. The short answer to that is I don't. I actually have an entire video that I did on this exact topic. So I will link that here for you guys if you want to go check it out. So I won't dive too much into the topic, but I will tell you that um, I don't really think I've talked about it here on the channel, but I grew up in a very dysfunctional household. Uh, my parents were not married. Uh, both of my parents were alcoholics. I was in and out of the foster care system. We had a rough life. You know, my mom raised us four kids on her own without any help from our fathers for the most part. And um, it's funny because as a grown up, I, I have more empathy for her than I have, you know, bad feelings towards her for the life that we live. Like as a mom now, I can see how hard it is to be a mother. Um, and I can't imagine doing that alone with four children working part time as a waitress half the time and then welfare on the side. Like I just, my heart aches when I think of the Christmases that she couldn't put one present under the tree for us. Um, I just can't imagine as a mom myself. Now I have empathy on her and she wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but she never left us like our daddies did. You know what I'm saying? She was there rain or shine and she didn't leave us. So that stands for something. But from that lifestyle and those elements, we, have some very toxic family members uh, and even toxic people in my adult life that I've encountered in jobs and things like that. And I'll tell you guys, uh, the video that I did was all about this, how to deal with, how I deal with toxic people, what I, my thoughts on forgiveness, when we should forgive, what does forgiveness really mean? Um, and I think that one of the big things is there is a common misconception that forgiveness means you have to allow someone to walk all over you. You have to be a doormat for somebody. And this is just Tina's opinion. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. This is just me. That is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is what Jesus did for us on the cross. Forgave us for our sins, our wretched sins. Even though we didn't deserve the forgiveness, he had mercy and he forgave us. Um, so when it comes to forgiveness... We are to forgive no matter what the circumstances are because God says we are to forgive. Who are we to think we shouldn't forgive, but he forgave us. So God's very clear about that in the Bible. But forgiveness does not mean that if you are not truly repentful for your actions or your lifestyle or the way that you treat me or my family, that I have to continue to allow you in my space. There's a difference between someone asking for forgiveness, apologizing, and being truly repentful, 
and someone that's just like saying it, it doesn't really mean it, and they keep doing the same things over and over again to hurt you, right? The Bible tells us we'll know if the tree is good or bad by the fruit that it puts off. So the fruit that it puts off, is it good? Is it wholesome? Is it uplifting? Is it positive? Does it make me feel good about myself? Does it make me want to be a better person? Does it make me want to do better? Or is the fruit of that tree, the fruit of that person, negative, condescending, backbiting, catty, makes me feel bad about myself, makes me doubt myself, makes me unhappy? I mean, it's just a very clear thing for me. The, the Lord was so clear. If you're trying to determine if a person is good or bad, look at, look at their fruit. So I'm all about forgiving someone if they truly come to me and ask for forgiveness. They're truly repentful. I'm all for that. What I don't do well with is sweeping things under the rug as if they never happened. And then we're just going to like go on about things like nothing ever happened. I personally do not work like that. Like we're going to do the hard thing. We're going to address whatever situation happened that, you know, put our relationship, put strain on our relationship. And then we can move forward from that. Like we can, you know, hug it out, whatever we need to do. And then I'm good. But I can't pretend like things didn't happen because that is always going to be there. And it's always going to fester for me. And then I'm going to start to get resentful and it's going to come out in negative ways that I don't want it to. So, um, I think when dealing with toxic people, boundaries are so important. And there's actually a book called Boundaries that I read last summer, Life Changing. I'm going to actually link that for you guys in the description of this video. Boundaries are a good thing. Boundaries are healthy. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, pardon my language, I have been called several times by people in my own family a stuck-up bitch. I am kind of known uh, as a bitch. And I think any time you put up healthy boundaries and you say, no, you may not do this to me anymore, or that really hurts my feelings, I don't like it when you do that, I, so I'm going to put up boundaries so that you can't hurt me anymore, especially if it's a, a person that you've communicated with many times and they just keep doing it. You guys, that's unhealthy. That's toxic. That is not love. So putting up boundaries is not a bad thing. And the people that are on the other side of that are going to look at you like, oh, look at her. She just thinks she's better than everybody. No, I don't think I'm better than everybody, but I have a right to protect myself, my home, and my children. So we all have to do that. And the boundaries will look different for everybody. Boundaries have to be put up. And sometimes it's really hard, but we have to do the hard thing because if we don't change something, nothing ever changes. So I think with toxic people, the first thing is setting up healthy boundaries. And that's really easy when you just sit down and write out a list of the things that they do that doesn't feel right in your tummy. Like you all know what I'm talking about. And it could be a million and one things, right? Depending on your situation. Write down the things that doesn't feel good in your tummy. Sit down, do the hard thing, have a cup of coffee with them, talk about that, set healthy boundaries for yourself that you are comfortable with, and then roll on with it. You know, do not second guess yourself because they don't like the boundaries that you put up. And sometimes it's a matter of, well, they're family and they're not respecting my boundaries. They keep doing the same thing over and over again. You guys, I've, I've mentioned this to you guys before. Um, I'm not getting much rapping done, am I? But it's kind of hard to rap at the same time as talking. I don't want it to be loud in the background, but I've mentioned before that I haven't spoke to my dad in many, many years. I think 2009 was the last time I talked to him. He was an alcoholic. He abandoned me. He was never a part of my life. Um, just, just the definition of a deadbeat father, to be honest with you. And, um, when he did come back into my life and I married Joe, he never liked Joe. And it wasn't because Joe did anything to me or to him. He was jealous of the relationship I had with Joe. And so that kind of carried into my marriage with Joe. When we would go back home to visit, my dad would say things like, oh, you and Lexi can stay here at my house, but Joe has to stay somewhere else. Those kinds of things. He would call on Friday nights when he was blasted drunk. And the first thing he would start doing is putting down my husband. That's not okay because me and Joe are one. Where Joe is, Tina is. Where Tina is, Joe is. You don't get one without the other. And out of respect for my husband, 
I had to give him an ultimatum and say, look, whether you like it or not, this is my husband. This is who God gave me. And at that point, you guys, we had been married for several years and he still couldn't get it through his head. But what you're not going to do is continue to disrespect my husband to me when we're on the phone or disrespect my husband in front of our daughter. And he couldn't respect those boundaries. And I told him, I love you. But until you can change and learn to accept Joe, I cannot have you in my life. So sometimes, you guys, it, it does require you to cut people off. And I know that's hard for some people. I am not that person. It's not hard for me to cut people off. It hurts. I'm sad. I wish you didn't have to be that way. But if you're toxic to me, I will cut you off so fast it'll make your head spin and it just, it is what it is. The other thing with toxic people is you have to remember that there are some relationships that are worth fighting for and some that just aren't. For example, I had, and I won't go into it too deep, but I had a really good friend. We were like super close, attached to the hips, hanging out all the time, texting every day, like did holidays together, trick-or-treating with the kids together. Like we were just great friends. All of a sudden, one day, I realized on Facebook that she was having barbecues at her house and like we weren't invited. Not saying that she has to invite us to everything, but I say that to say it was out of the norm because we did everything together. So if we did barbecues or birthday parties, we were always inviting each other. And I was like, oh my gosh, like why didn't we get invited? And then I realized one day that she had deleted me off of Facebook and blocked me. Um, actually, I don't think she blocked me. I think she just deleted me because when I looked for her name, I was still able to see her. Anyway, friggin' Facebook, right? <laughs> but um, I thought, wow, okay, I was extremely hurt by that because we were super close and I felt really betrayed. What really got me more than anything is I didn't know why. I didn't know what I did to deserve that. And Actually, when I was speaking with our counselor, Maya and Joe's counselor, about this one day, he said, well, did you ever ask her? Did you ever call her or ask her, you know, what happened? And I said, you know, I didn't and I won't. Because to me, if I've done something to offend you or I've hurt you, I'm a big girl and I know how to swallow my pride and say I'm sorry. But if you don't come to me and tell me what I did, how can I make it right? And we were supposed to be like homies, you know what I'm saying? And you just like block me out of your life without telling me what I did. In my opinion, that's not even a relationship that's worth fighting for because we weren't truly friends to begin with. If you could do that to me, we weren't truly friends. Our friendship wasn't as deep as I thought it was. So no, I'm not going to waste my time texting and reaching out to someone like that. I'd rather put my energy and efforts into going after a friendship with someone else that truly wants to nurture the relationship just as much as I do. To answer the question, how do you deal with toxic family members? And she specifically asks about family members is those things right there, setting boundaries, having a clear discussion with them, and then knowing and being willing to back up what you say. If they don't respect the boundaries, sometimes you guys, you've got to cut people out of your space. And I know that that's an unpopular opinion, watch the video that I linked to this very topic because I talk a lot about scripture and yes, God is love. You guys have heard me say this, but God is also a God of judgment and God is also very clear on the type of people that we are not to have in our lives. We are not to hang out with certain people that are toxic for us. There's a little Robin sitting on the fence post. And for me, again, this is just Tina, family makes no difference, whether it's family or it's a neighbor down the street. Just because we've got the same blood running through our veins doesn't mean I'm going to let you step on me any more than I would let the neighbor down the street step on me. Does that make sense? You have to be willing to stand up for yourself and you have to be willing to stand up for your family and deal with toxic people, whether they're family or not. And it's not easy, I'll tell you that. And you might get called some nasty, nasty names if you try to stand up for yourself. <laughs> People don't like it when you set boundaries. Okay, this one is like super big and I don't know if I'm gonna have enough wrapping paper. Mm, I might, let's see. So you guys know I color coordinate my wrapping paper. I think I told you guys that. So I'm excited because I picked up two new rolls the other day at the store. So it feels so weird not having Lexi here this year. Oh, I miss my baby girl. 
But I was so excited, you guys. We got a huge box in the mail from Lexi the other day, and she bought all of us gifts. And then I saw that she paid $67 to ship it here. <laughs> oh, but I thought it was so sweet that she actually took the time and the effort, spent the money, and got us all gifts. This sweater is actually one of them. She knows that I love this color, so she bought me this sweater and a new charm for my bracelet. You guys do the Pandora charms? Lexi, Lexi actually started me on this, and Lexi's pretty much gotten me every charm that's on this bracelet, so it means a lot to me. And they all have different meanings, of course, as you guys know, so it's super special. The next question is from, I hope I'm saying her name right, Chanel Riggs. And she says, what were your homeschooling challenges in the beginning? Um, I thought about this a little bit. And I think, so my personality, you guys, I, I was never afraid to homeschool. Um, that's just not my personality, to be afraid of doing new things. I actually think I'm really sick because I get like a high out of like jumping off the cliff and doing something different. Uh, I just love it. I love stepping out on faith. I love um, doing new things. I am just a firm believer that when I'm 90 sitting in a rocking chair, I don't want to look back on my life and wonder if I could have done something. I want to do it. And if I fail, then so be it. I failed at a lot of things, let me tell you. But at least you will never wonder if you could have done it. You're going to know. And I'm also a firm believer that you can't figure out what you want to do until you figure out what you don't want to do. Allah, right? I mean, that goes with anything. Your job, whether you decide to homeschool your kids or not, if you think you can do it. You can't figure out if you're going to like it unless you give it a try. And it's okay to fail. Failing makes you a better person and gives you experience. And I don't know about you guys, but I hate wondering. I don't want to wonder. I want to know. Like, yeah, I did that and it was like, it was not for me. Or I did that and it was the best decision I made in my entire life. And homeschooling Parker is one of the best decisions I ever made. And I've never looked back. There's definitely been days, obviously, where I'm like, <laughs> you should probably go to your room because if not, you won't be alive in the next 10 minutes. But I still... <laughs> I still love him, and I don't regret homeschooling him at all. I think in the beginning, when I first started homeschooling Parker, one of my biggest challenges was comparing myself to other people. I had never done it before. I had watched a bunch of YouTube channels and things, and I'm like, oh, wow, you know, she does this and she does that, and I tried to mimic what they were doing just because I didn't know any better. And I also tried to mimic a classroom. And I think a lot of people do that. Not that there's anything wrong with it, especially if you have a lot of kids, that structure and organization might work out really well. But for me, just homeschooling Parker, it didn't make sense for me to have a schoolroom. It didn't make sense for me to have a dry erase board with, you know, all the posters on the wall. And it just, it really didn't. Parker and I, you guys have seen my homeschool cart. It's like our mobile school room. We roll the cart out in the morning. We do school at the kitchen table. Sometimes on the couch, we do our reading. Just wherever we're comfortable doing school that day. And it wasn't until, so Parker did kindergarten in public school. And I pulled him out after kindergarten. And we've been homeschooling ever since. And he's in fourth grade. So... I would say it probably wasn't until second grade that I was like, you yeah, know, this ain't working out for me because I was just trying to do all the things that all the other moms were doing. For example, I don't do morning basket. I don't do, I don't do all that. Like we do reading in the morning. I read him his devotional. We read a chapter from the Bible each morning, um, but I just don't do the morning basket and all the things. Like we really just dive right into school. Parker and I both like to just knock it out so we can get on with our life. And I've told you guys this before. So I think my biggest challenge was not comparing myself to other people, realizing that 
I'm a different mom, Parker's a different kid, our lifestyle's different, and just finding what worked best for me. And once you figure out what works best for you and your kids, it's gonna feel so much better and it's gonna flow better as well. So I honestly think that that was probably my biggest challenge because some of my biggest hurdles came from trying to do too much, trying to do what other moms were doing just because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Or I thought I wasn't good enough because I wasn't doing what they were doing. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. Go on Pinterest, look up homeschool classroom and go to some of the YouTube channels. It'll, it could make you feel real quick like you are not good enough. And the reality is our worst day in homeschooling is better than a day in public school any day. That's that's just a reality. There's no comparison to that child having that independent education one-on-one -on -one with the person that loves them the most in the entire world, right? So I would just suggest not to compare yourself to anybody. Find a good curriculum that you're comfortable with and also if you find a curriculum that you don't like, don't be afraid to change it. That was another challenge was finding the right curriculum that worked for us and not being afraid to toss one if it's not working for you or your child. Because if you keep trying to push a curriculum that you're not digging or your kid's not digging, you're gonna be miserable and so is your child. And you don't want them to hate being homeschooled and you don't wanna hate homeschooling them. So just suck it up, bite the bullet, toss it, get the one you think you're gonna like. And like I said before, you won't wonder, you'll know, like, oh, I tried that, I didn't like it. I tried this and I love it. Makes it so much better, trust me. All right, so we got Parker this little ax kit because he thinks he's a little man. He sneaks into Joe's bathroom drawer and he puts on Joe's deodorant and his like body spray. So I'm like, okay, we're gonna get him his own little set. <laughs> All right, let's see, next question. How long do you think, uh, okay, so this is from Deborah Trout. How long do you think it will take you to drive to Alaska? That's a great question. So as I told you guys, we are gonna drive across country from Virginia to Washington State, and then we're gonna be taking the ferry, the Alaska Marine Highway System, to Alaska. As far as the drive goes, we've driven across country several times, obviously moving with the military, uh, but this time we're gonna be pulling that enclosed trailer that I was telling you guys about. So we are giving ourselves a little extra time um, because we are gonna be pulling the trailer and also because of the time of year that we're gonna be going. So now that we're staying here in Virginia and we're waiting for Joe to retire, we anticipate hitting the road to go to Alaska in October, the beginning of October, 2022. And because he will already be retired, we're not on anybody's time schedule. Tentatively, the plan is, you guys know we're taking my grandpa with us, and my nana, his wife, is buried in Southern California, uh, in Los Angeles. That's where they spent most of their married years. And he's so cute, you guys. He asked Joe and I, and you could tell that he was kind of like, oh, I don't wanna like impose or make the trip harder, but if we take a Southern route, is there any way we can swing through and see Nana one last time? Because he is gonna be 90 in February. It's like super long, but I'm just gonna like roll with it. Stick it down in there, make it work. Uh, so he knows that when he gets to Alaska with us and we start our Alaskan adventure, he probably won't make it down to California again. So we are planning on taking a southern route so we can go through Los Angeles and see my Nana's grave. Then we're going to head north to California and stop and see Lexi because you guys know she's in California now. And then we'll head up to Washington stop in and see my mama because my mama lives in Washington State and then catch the ferry from there. So I'm estimating, give or take, um, probably 10 days of driving. We're also going to try to stop in Kentucky and see the Ark Encounter. I've always wanted to show that to Parker. So we're, that's right next to us here in Virginia. So it's on the way out. I think we're gonna try and do that, but just take our time. Like we're not on anybody's time schedule, thank goodness, no stress other than 
meeting the fairy on time for the date that we're booked, we can really stop and see the sights and do things. So I'm estimating, Deborah, about 10 days, give or take, with the weather and things like that because it'll be the fall when we're heading out. So we also got Parker this vehicle DVD set or DVD player. He's always wanted one of these and it's really for the Alaska trip. You know, that's gonna be a lot of driving and even on the ferry, he can use this. It's a five day ferry ride to watch movies and stuff. So he doesn't know that we got this, but we got this for the truck so he can watch movies on the road trip across country. All right, next question. How did you find your cabin? Okay, so this is our Becca Swash Bucklers. I probably just chopped that up. They say, how did you find your cabin? And no, in caps, it was in a good location, etc. I have a hard time getting any realtor to give me info. Thanks. All right, so um, we looked for a cabin in Alaska for well over a year. We put in several offers with our realtor and none of them worked out for multiple different reasons. Um, some of them we were outbid. Some of them the seller was just completely unreasonable and unrealistic and didn't want to negotiate on any of the terms. So we would pass on them. But the first thing I did was find a realtor because when you're purchasing in another state, you need, to have, you need to have boots on the ground. You need to have someone there that can be your eyes and ears for you. And then you need to make sure that they're a good realtor. You guys know I'm a realtor here in Virginia and there are a lot of realtors in my area. Um, some of them aren't the greatest, I'm not gonna lie. I work with some of them and I'm just like, you should probably go do something else with your life, you know what I'm saying? So finding a good realtor Someone that's not just in it for the money, like someone that actually cares about their clients is super important. And I think with me being a realtor, I was a lot more critical of the realtor that I used. And I was also very critical of the entire transaction process in purchasing our cabin. And that's why I tell our realtor all the time, like, dude, you seriously are like an awesome realtor because I'm a control freak. I have a hard time letting go and letting someone else do things, especially because I am a realtor. I wasn't the one writing the contract, doing the negotiating. I couldn't talk to the seller. I couldn't talk to the seller's agent. And that was really hard for me, but he did really well. So I think that I would start with finding a good realtor. And this could be as easy as calling different real estate brokerages and saying, hey, you know, talk to the, the broker, the person in charge and tell them your situation. Tell them you're looking for a good realtor. Um, someone that has, you know, a good reputation and let them recommend someone to you because they will. And the other thing is, if you're not happy with your realtor, fire them. They work for you. I mean, I, I can say that like if my client wasn't happy with me, I'm not going to hold them to a contract with me. Like I want them to go work with someone that they're happy with, but I also bust my butt and follow the golden rule and try to treat others the way I would want to be treated. So if you're not happy with the experience that you have from your agent, don't be afraid to fire them and get a new one. I mean, you can try communicating with them and saying, Hey, you're starting to irritate me. You're not returning my calls. You're not returning my text messages. I have questions or whatever. Um, but if they're not listening again, talking about healthy boundaries, right? If they're not, being respectful of what you've asked and they're not doing their job, then they don't deserve to earn that commission. So don't be afraid to fire someone that you don't feel is working on your behalf and has your best interest at heart. The other thing is deciding your location. Um, we use Google Earth a lot because you can see a lot on Google Earth as far as the layout of a property, where it sets, what it's next to, is it, you know, how far is it from town? Are there creeks and rivers and lakes nearby? You know, depending on what you plan on doing. But Google Earth really comes in handy. We had our realtor set us up with a search feed to send us properties that came on the market that matched our criteria that we were looking for. But I also set up a Zillow search for myself. And if I saw something on there that he hadn't sent me, I would screenshot it and send it to him and say, hey, can you pull this property, get the details and let me know what's up with it. 
uh, our realtor was awesome. He would go out to these properties and FaceTime us and he was our eyes and ears and he was amazing. So the other thing is deciding what you want in a property. What's most important to you? Joe and I knew about how much land we wanted. We also knew that we wanted some kind of water on the property, whether it was a running creek or a pond. We knew that we wanted that. Uh, and we knew what our criteria was for a cabin. We knew that we needed something with septic. We knew that we wanted something that already had a well on it. So those were things that we looked for when we were looking for a property. Would you guys look at this kitty? He's my little wrapping buddy. Aren't you, Jack? Are you my little wrapping buddy? Oh, oh, look at that fat belly. Yeah, I'm such a handsome kid, eh? Oh, I love you, Jack. I know, you're so handsome. Yeah. Oh, <gasps> oh, you're so cute. So we bought our cabin sight unseen, essentially. Our realtor went up there and walked the property in the cabin and FaceTimed us, and we were like, yep, put in the offer. So actually, I think I had him put in the offer first, knowing that if we didn't like it from the walkthrough, we could you know, terminate the contract uh, via some other contingencies that we had built into our offer. After we saw the property on FaceTime, we were like, this is the one as far as we could tell, right, from Virginia. And we booked plane tickets to go see the property and attend the home inspection. And, you know, when you say, like, how did you know it was the one, it just needs to check all the boxes, like the location that you want to be, check out the schools in the area, check out the weather, check out the snowfall, check out all the things that are important to you for where you're going to live and make sure that it checks all the boxes for what you guys are looking for. Obviously, the price needs to fit your budget, but once all those boxes are checked, the only way to really know is to go visit the property. And sometimes that's not always possible. As a realtor myself, I have closed deals for clients where the property was sight unseen. And, you know, they sign an addendum acknowledging that they haven't seen the property and they still want to move forward and buy this house. But for me, we were, this is our forever homestead. I, I definitely was not comfortable, especially with it being Alaska, purchasing a property without seeing it, touching it, smelling it for myself. So we flew up there in July this summer for the home inspection. And there was just absolutely no doubt in my mind that it was the property for us. So as far as finding the right property, I think it starts with a good realtor or someone that can be boots on the ground for you. And then sitting down and making a list yourself or with your spouse of the things that are most important to you and making sure that that property checks all those boxes and then not being afraid to pull the trigger, right? Because sometimes we can make ourselves crazy. And the reality is you guys, there's always gonna be a better property. And I deal with this with buyers a lot. We'll go look at, you know, you look at six to 10 houses, your buyer should be able to choose one of those houses because all of those houses, we only went to see them because they fell within the criteria of what they wanted, where they are, how big they are, all the things. So if you go see that many houses and you're still not happy, sometimes it's because you're always afraid there's something better. Well, what if there's another one? What if there's, you know, there's always gonna be another one. Like we've seen properties, I had to straight turn off my Zillow feed after we put the contract in on the Alaska cabin because there was other ones that came on the market that I was like, oh, but this one has that and ours doesn't. Y'all, you'll make yourself crazy. Like find what you want, make sure it checks the boxes, have a realtor you can trust and pull the trigger. If that's really what you wanna do, you gotta make that decision sometimes. I think that Sitting on the fence sometimes is like the worst thing in the world and there is freedom in the decision making. So, so Joe got Parker a new pocket knife. Parker's all boy, loves to go fishing. That will really come in handy. And he's like a little mini Joe. Everything that Joe has or does, he wants to be just like him. It's super cute. So we got him this little pocket knife. He'll be really excited. Next question is from Angie Horn. I, Angie, I giggled on this one, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> she says, what is your beauty routine? 
your face is flawless. Aw, Angie, you're so nice. I giggled because I'm like, for real? <laughs> um, I don't think my face is flawless, but you know, I, I don't take compliments very well. What do they say? You're just supposed to say thank you and smile and move on, right? Um, so when I was a teenager, I had major acne, major acne. And I even had um, acne on my chest. And I actually have some scars from how bad my acne was. Really embarrassing, right? As a teenage girl, having acne on your chest. But I don't know what happened after I had Lexi. Um, I don't know if it was hormones. I don't know what it was. All my acne went away. And I legit have no issues with acne anymore. You know what gives me acne? Wearing a face mask. Every time I wear those things, I get like little zits all around my mouth and my like nose area. But I am really big on natural skincare. Um, what do they say? Our skin is the largest organ on our body or in our body, whatever, however you want to say it. Is it an organ? Am I saying that right? I don't know. I remember reading and they were saying like, when you put stuff on your skin, it enters your bloodstream super fast. So if you're not being mindful of the products that you're putting on your skin, you could be damaging yourself in, in, in a big way. Um, hormonally, all kinds of stuff. So to me, simple is better. I do not do the skincare regimens that are like 50 million steps. I can't do that. Give me a good cleanser. Give me a good moisturizer. I don't use eye cream because I feel like if you have a good moisturizer, that should be good enough as your eye cream. So I like to keep things super simple. Simple cleanser, simple moisturizer. Um, one thing that I think is really important, I never go to bed with my makeup on. Part of that is because I wear contacts and after wearing contacts all day, anybody that wears contacts knows, I cannot wait to get my makeup off at the end of the night so I can just rub the heck out of my eyeballs because you can't rub your eyeballs during the day when you have contacts in. I never go to bed with makeup on. I wash my face every night before bed and I wash it every morning when I wake up. And I mentioned this in my last video uh, fairly quickly, but I use products from Tubes & Co. I will link their website in the video description. And I have a coupon code for you guys. I talked to Tubes & Co told them how much I love them and how much I wanted to share their products with you guys and they gave me a coupon code for free shipping on your entire order. Coupon code is blessed and beautiful and I will also put that in the description of the video. Tubes & Co is a small homesteading family like most of us and they do everything on their own. They have like this little workshop that they create the products, they do the packaging and labeling and the shipping and everything all on their own all organic, all natural, um, tallow creams. I mean, you guys, they're straight using the stuff that our ancestors used. Back in the day, they did not have the skincare and makeup products that we have today. They just didn't. And so a lot of the moisturizers and things were taken from tallow, fat, rendered fat from animals, right? Essential oils, all the things. It's like totally up my alley. And if you guys have never used an oil cleanser, you got to try their cleanser. It is just so supple, so rich, smells so good. It has a citrusy smell to it. That is all I use to clean my face. And then I use a simple moisturizer from them. And one of my favorite products is their glow serum. It is so radiant and so moisturizing. I don't really think I have a secret to my skincare regimen other than I try to drink a lot of water, I wash my face every night before bed, wash it in the morning, and even if I'm not going anywhere and I'm not putting makeup on, I still wash my face in the morning. I moisturize, I use my glow serum, and I really try to not use chemicals on my face. That's all there is to it. Pretty straightforward, right? All right, next question is from Pepper Grower. What are you guys, what are your guys' plans for work in Alaska? maybe live off the land, question mark. Um, okay, so pepper grower. I think when you say work work in Alaska, I wonder if you're asking like, are we actually gonna work a job? The answer to that is no. Um, so the idea is that Joe is gonna retire from the military and we will have his pension um, pending the, uh, how do I say this? Pending his exemption for the you know what? 
that we submitted a couple months ago. We still have not heard anything on that, just FYI, in case you guys were wondering. We submitted that request, exemption request, probably three months ago now, and we haven't heard anything. I have heard through the grapevine that, that they have started reviewing and, uh, oh gosh, did they cut it too short? Oh, perfect. Uh, and denying some of them, and I'm assuming we're gonna hear something any day now. So if they deny his request for the you know what, we will be getting separated from the military less than a year before his retirement. Sad, right? I know. That's like a whole other discussion um, that I cannot have here on YouTube for reasons that I've talked to you guys about before. I don't want my content deleted and I don't want to be censored. Unfortunately, that's the world we're living in. But for me and Joe, it's principle, and we will not sacrifice our beliefs and our principles for anybody or anything. Not for a pension, not for insurance, not for any of it. We'll be okay, we've always been okay. We've been in rough situations before, and we've always made it through. And the government does not provide for my family. The Lord does. So the hope is that we will have Joe's pension so, and I have other um, entrepreneurial endeavors and things. Obviously, our YouTube channel, we do make an income off of our YouTube channel. It's nothing crazy, but it does supplement our income. Okay, so Joe and I are debt-free. And there's so much that goes behind how we got debt-free. Let me know if you guys want me to do a video on that. I can talk about that. A lot of things that I've learned along the way, some things that we implement um, that we still use to this day as far as like credit, how to use it the right way, how to make it work for you, so on and so on. But we are debt free and um, so the only, you know, our bills are going to be minimal at the Alaska cabin, like our cell phone bill, internet, things like that. So with Joe's pension and some of the things that I have going on behind the scenes, we will be making plenty of money to sustain our family in Alaska. We do plan on living off the land as much as possible. You guys know we already do that here in Virginia with um, you know, our chickens, fresh eggs, our gardening every year, preserving food all throughout the year for the winter. And then we haven't had it here on this property, but the farm before here, we had our own dairy cow, we, had, we butchered pigs, we did all the things. But in Alaska, um, we're gonna be hunting and we're gonna be fishing a lot, you guys. I love salmon. Alaskan shrimp is the best you've ever had. Like we're gonna do all the things. So we're gonna have a huge greenhouse we plan on building. We're gonna be gardening, fishing, hunting, preserving, doing all the things that we try to do here. So the plan is not to work a job. I wanna move to Alaska and focus solely on the homestead, solely on homeschooling Parker and on uh, growing my YouTube channel and just creating content for you guys. I really love this. Uh, you guys know this started out as a hobby for me, just like a creative outlet, but I've just grown to really love it and love the community that we built here. It's not just about making videos anymore. It's the relationships that we built through the channel that I really love. So we have definitely learned over the last seven or eight years, especially that less is more. Like, I don't need the big house, I don't need the fancy car, I don't need all the things, I don't need to get my nails done. Like, that's not where I find happiness anymore. I find happiness in that first cabbage head that grows. I find happiness in Parker learning a new math problem because I taught him, which is really crazy because I was never good at math, but I'm doing it, y'all. So I find happiness in time, like time spent camping, hiking, hunting, cooking and just being a family on the homestead. That is most important to me. So. All right, so we have two more questions. Next one comes from Challenges Into Blessings, and they say, will you be videoing your drive and ferry ride to Alaska with homeschooling? What do you do when Parker doesn't want to do it? Um, do you have any activities planned for the trip for Parker? So we will be videoing the entire trip to Alaska. We even have a drone that we got so that we can capture some really awesome footage for you guys of that trip and what it looks like. So yes, we are gonna be filming the entire trip up there. 
And I just, I fantasize and daydream about that day that we pull into the property and we're home. Like I just, I fantasize about that. As far as Parker, yes. So some of the activities um, I'm probably not as organized as some moms might be, so it's not like, yeah, I'm not very organized. <laughs> so he's going to have coloring books and he's going to have toys. He's going to be able to watch movies on the new DVD player that we bought him for the truck. We are going to be stopping every night and staying in a hotel along the way. We've kind of already budgeted for that. And I just think for the family and for my grandpa, I think that that's gonna be the best thing is just stopping every night so everybody can eat and get well rested and then get back on the road the next day. Um, as far as homeschooling, what do you do when Parker doesn't wanna do it? Oh, well, I'm gonna make him do it, you know what I'm Everybody raises their kids different. Um, this is, this might sound crazy to some people, but Parker doesn't have a choice whether he wants to do it. That's just not how I've raised my kids. Like he doesn't have a choice and he knows that school needs to get done. Sometimes in life we have to do hard things. We have to do things that we don't really want to do so that we can do what we want to do later. Um, but I say that to say there are times that Parker is having a bad day and he's got a really bad attitude. Y'all think he's all cute and stuff, you know what I'm saying? But he definitely has those days where he's rolling his eyes, sighing, like <sighs> slamming his pencil, you know, just being like completely disrespectful. And there's moments where I have to stop, remove myself from the situation, and I have to legit tell him, go do laps in the backyard, go run a lap around the backyard. We have a miniature trampoline that I bought for our homeschooling because he's a boy and he has so much energy. And it's, it's, it's learning your child and knowing how long they can go before they need a break and what works for them and what doesn't. And for Parker, we make a game out of it. Like sometimes if I can see he's getting super frustrated or just burn out, like we've been at something for 25 minutes straight, 30 minutes straight, I'm like, all right, go, go jump on your trampoline. Uh, not the trampoline in the backyard where he just broke his arm, right? But our little one that we have for the house. Go do laps around the living room and say your ABCs. And he thinks it's funny. He's at that age where he's like, okay. He runs or, you know, do five push-ups, run around the classroom, like, or run around the living room. Like, that's just what we do sometimes to burn off energy. But I do not allow disrespect. If there is clear disrespect from Parker, there are clear consequences. And those consequences are many different things. He loses screen time, which is precious to him because we monitor that and do not allow our son to sit in front of electronics for hours on end. He'll get early bedtime. Um, there's lots of different things that I can use as consequences for Parker. Early bedtime, oh, that'll do it. Like, oh, he hates early bedtime. What do I do when Parker doesn't wanna do schoolwork? It kind of depends on the situation, but there's no option not to do schoolwork. It has to get done. If we're having a super bad day, there has been times where I'm like, okay, let's finish language arts and math, and then we will take a break and we'll do reading later tonight after dinner. Like, everybody has those days, you guys, right? Like, and that's part of why we homeschool because I love the flexibility of being able to decide how we wanna do things. But there's nothing wrong with saying, okay, we're done. We did math and language arts and we're gonna just do reading after dinner tonight. And every time he has a totally refreshed attitude because sometimes they just need that break. Sometimes it's too much. But another thing is rewarding them for their good behavior. Instead of saying, if you don't finish this or you don't stop with your attitude, you're gonna have a consequence. You could totally flip that and you can say, Parker, Let's play a game. I'm gonna set the timer, and if you can get this math lesson done in 25 minutes before that timer goes off, we're gonna go on a bike ride. There's, Parker's easy because he's nine years old. There's a lot of things that he's like, oh, that's amazing, yeah. So I found that positive reinforcement is so much better than negative consequences, but consequences do have their place for blatant disrespect and, you know, outrages. <laughs> Okay, so I think I'm gonna have to wrap it up, you guys, but I'll answer uh, one more and then I'm gonna finish wrapping these presents. 
The next question is from Robin Dougherty, I think is how you say it. She says, we are fairly new to chickens, still waiting on our first egg. Oh, that's exciting. But I never realized how sweet they are and how much I would love them. We have 16 chickens, various breeds, but this one, Dominique Chicken, we have named Ginger, is the sweetest thing ever. Do you have a favorite farm animal that you have had, have or had a special bond with? Yes, Robin. Uh, on the farm, our 18 acre farm, before we moved here to the one acre homestead, I had a dairy cow. She was a Jersey and her name was Gracie. She is by far my favorite farm animal we've ever had. We had her for two years. I've, I've never had a dairy animal before Gracie and y'all, <laughs> I bought her on Craigslist, didn't have a clue what I was doing, didn't even have a milk stanchion built didn't have a shelter built for her like poor Joe it's like hey Joe this guy this farmer's delivering this cow on Saturday I need you to build me a milk stanchion and a shelter um, but you spend two years under the warm flank of a cow milking her every day without fail and you just build a relationship with her like you guys I used to lean into her and sometimes I would sing to her while I was milking her I watched her have several calves on the farm and just like the whole cycle of that process and the delicious fresh raw milk that she gave our family we just built a relationship like i i used to go lay in the hammock in the summer on the farm property and i would let her out of her pen to come graze on the grass you guys she would come over and lay next to the hammock like she just liked being near me we were homies we were like we were like this you know what I'm so when we moved we had to sell her and I was super sad. That was probably the hardest animal to get rid of. Nerf guns, right? Anybody that's got boys, Nerf guns is a sure winner for Christmas. Um, but I think Gracie was by far my favorite farm animal and I miss her so much. I don't know if we'll ever do another dairy cow just because our little family is so small that that is a lot of milk to deal with. Even if we're doing all the things and we're making cheese and we're making yogurt and all, you know, my grandpa doesn't drink the milk. So it's just me, Joe and Parker. But I have mentioned this to you guys. I may do another dairy sheep when we get to Alaska because when we milk the sheep here on the one acre homestead, I was in love with the milk. And I love the fact that it was a smaller animal, so it was easier to maintain. She was cheaper to feed. And I would milk our Delilah girl and get a pint of milk every day from her, our sheep. Versus when I would milk Gracie, I was getting anywhere from a gallon and a half to two gallons a day. You guys, that's a lot of milk. My favorite animal by far was Gracie. And I think being out there in Alaska and being far enough away from like the main grocery stores and stuff, I think that it might behoove us to have a small dairy animal on the homestead. All right, you guys, I loved the questions and really appreciate you guys, you know, participating in that. That was really fun. But I'm gonna go ahead and get this wrapped up and then we'll head into the kitchen and we will do our cookies.
I thank you so much for hanging out with me on this video, you guys. I know it was a little long, but I wanted to answer your questions. And I just want to wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from our homestead to yours. See you next year.